What is up, captains and cadets? What a crazy week we just had. I'm going to go over the AMA that the co-founders all launched on Wednesday on Discord, and we're going to talk about everything. I remixed it, so even if you listen to it live, you might want to re-watch this video, and you might be able to get something out of it that you missed the first time. And if you missed the AMA, you're going to really enjoy this because the team said a lot of positive things, and let's get into it. Let's go. What's up, Mud Zonies and Oosters? Just in case you missed the AMA and you want to rewatch it in its entirety, you can do so on Star Atlas TV. Also, the Hologram News Network has rebroadcast it on their channel too. Um, I'm sure almost every everyone knows about this already, but the Star Atlas team has restructured. They're down to 45 teammates. You can read all about it in Michael Wagner's note that's um, posted on Discord. And, you know, at first I think most of us um, got a little scared about the situation, but that's why we're here today. We're going to see what the team has to say about it in the AMA. Um, I just do, do want to touch base on, um, here's a little tweet from Blockchain Man that said, Yesterday, more than 120 of my brothers and sisters lost their job working on Star Atlas. Our immediate concern is to making sure everyone that needs a paycheck gets back to work. And I just want to send my absolute deepest gratitude and thanks for everything that the 120 people that no longer work for Star Atlas have accomplished. It is just amazing. And don't worry, guys, you guys are going to find a job or you guys are going to be back with Star Atlas really quick once the team rolls out all the things that you guys have created. So let's hear from Michael Wagner himself and hear what he has to say about why he let the team go. And let's do it. Oh, one one last thing. I usually put kind of a funny uh, Captain Swag meme, but because of the severity of this whole entire topic, I'm just going to let it go like this. Earlier this week, we announced that we have reduced the team. Uh, we eliminated 122 positions. We still have a core team of, it's, it's 45 on paper, but we really have closer to 55 people um, internal to Automata, excluding co-creation studios that are, that are still on the team and working with us in some capacity, whether that's on payroll or through some updated contractual relationship that we have with them that allows them uh, to continue working on the, on the product. So um, it was a deep cut. It was hard. It was a very hard decision to make, but again, it positions us quite well for sustainability going forward. And what's really positive here is we do have a ton of ammunition, ton of fuel in the tank, and, and I'm extremely excited about the things that we'll have coming up uh, for release in August. But there's a lot of optimism on the team, a lot of enthusiasm on the team. I'm uh, more optimistic than I have been in a long time. And while it was certainly an extremely challenging decision to make reductions to the team, to lose people, um, not a path I would have wanted to take, um, this is completely standard course of business to adjust for market conditions. All of the biggest tech companies out there in the world are, are making layoffs right now, the Googles and the Metas. They're laying off tens of thousands of people to adjust for market cycle. And that's all we're doing is we're adjusting for the market cycle and, and our sustainability going into the future. So I feel really good about this. I don't feel good about letting go of amazing, talented team members, but we are going to rebuild from this. We are going to grow from all of the ammunition, all of the tools that we have uh, in our arsenal right now. And uh, we're going to look to rehire um, uh, all of the people that, that were let go, or at least many of them, as many of them as we can. So um, this is not a bad thing, guys. We have, uh, we've been able to extend the runway out for one year plus, um, and, and uh, the, bright, the, the future is extremely bright. We just had a really incredible all hands team call and we're amped, we're, we're, we're excited. Um, I think we have so much on the horizon starting in August, um, uh, which in many ways is unfortunate because a lot of the people that contributed to the stuff that we're about to release uh, did get cut. But um, again, this is just a necessity of the business uh, and gives us better opportunities going forward for growth. All right, next let's hear what CEO co-founder Michael Wagner has to say about how we got here. Um, a couple of these videos are just sped up just to keep the time down, just to let you guys know. I really think of us as more of a platform than just a game. Now at the center of our development platform and ecosystem, of course, is this really amazing product that's called Star Atlas. And that is the hook. The game is the attraction. That is what helps us build and deliver this idea of a new digital society. And it's all done through, um, done so through a sophisticated economic simulation that allows for real labor markets to exist, real businesses to form, real opportunities to persist, things like play to earn. Um, but uh, you know, through the course of this year, we've been building, we did make some reductions back in uh, December going into J January uh, to offset some of our expenses. Building something like this, like Star Atlas is incredibly capital intensive. Um, uh, I could like examples like Star Citizen, for example, that's spending, uh, based on our data, spending upwards of $8 million per month on their development team. 
uh, uh, we were spending a lot of money building a AAA product and open world expansive MMO is an incredibly capital intensive undertaking. I want everybody to be aware that our model from inception is the same as it is now. When we launched in January of 2021 with a white paper and a dream, we did not have the capital necessary to build out the full AAA product. It's always been about this iterative modular release where we create product and features, we roll those out, we start to grow, we attract users, we generate revenue, and we continuously reinvest revenue that we make to build out the long-term vision of the product. That's no different today as it was in January of 2021. And yes, we had phenomenal success in 2021 that allowed us to rapidly scale up our team to a level we never would have anticipated, just to be clear. Uh, we never expected making 170, uh, well, almost $200 million over the course of a year and a half. Like that is phenomenal success. That is top 1% of any businesses all over the world that have ever achieved success like that. We scaled our team uh, to um, be commensurate with the amount of revenue that we generated. And yes, we had uh, the kind of disconnection of significantly decreasing values in our treasury, which I've outlined previously, but that includes things like minus $65 million on Atlas balances that we held in treasury because we did not want to go out and sell that into the community while we were still building the initial feature sets of the game. Um, things like a, a substantial tax liability that wasn't completely anticipated. Of course, we know we have to pay taxes, but it was a $30 million tax bill in 2021, higher than I expected. Uh, we lost $15 million on FTX. Um, and collectively across these things, we're talking about a, a swing of $110 million in our balance sheet when we had scaled anticipating access or the use of those funds. All right, and now let's hear about who is left on the team. Jacob, Danny, and myself are ride or die taking this thing all the way to the end. And, and again, I don't want to put a negative light on this whatsoever, but even if every other opportunity in front of us, which is a vast amount of opportunities, failed, Jacob, Danny, and myself would still be here driving this vision, trying to make it work. Um, there's just way too many opportunities for us to fail, in my opinion. But again, even in the absolute worst case scenario, we're still driving this forward and finding a way to make this work. Um, so no impact to their roles. They're still in, in their same positions. What we have done is all taken a reduction in salary, myself going down to absolute minimum wage, uh, which I think is is justifiable given the position of the company. Uh, but all of the leadership has taken reduction in salaries and and uh, we're fully committed just to making this work. By no means did we eliminate the uh, the Unreal Engine team and the work that we're doing on uh, Showroom and, and the 2.2 release. Uh, of the, like I said, it's really it's really a bit more than 45, 45 officially are on um, on payroll, but we have some other arrangements in place with people. But we have 19 uh, that are focused on game system design. Uh, this is for both Unreal Engine 5 product and Sage. Uh, this also includes things like the art production. Um, and I do want to point out that we were able to retain all of the art directors, which were always internal. Um, okay, so 19 on, uh, you know, as I said, um, on uh, game system design and, and game development, uh, we have another 19 people that are in engineering. Uh, we've kept, let me see, seven people uh, in blockchain. This is one of the departments that, that probably saw the least amount of, uh, of cuts because, hey, we're building a product that lives entirely on chain. Uh, we need experts in that uh, on chain development domain. So 19 uh, in engineering, but the rest of those are in uh, both web, web development and infrastructure. Uh, I wanted to highlight here econ. Um, uh, economics is so important in the product that we're developing. It's really what allows for this opportunity to exist. The things like play to earn. It's where you know I see the biggest advantages of building in Web3 as in econ. So um, we we still have uh, Chris as our head of game economy, uh, and we also retained uh, Gareth. So we have two people. Uh, Gareth is an analyst. Chris is the head of game economy. Um, uh, these guys are going to be able to contribute most directly to the um, uh, game economic system design, uh, which is really the you know the things that we're rolling out now, we'll still be able to um, deliver the quarterly. Uh, Steven was an amazing contributor to that, um, as was Eric, uh, doing an amazing job of, of helping to lead and manage that department. And Anurag was a, another analyst that we did unfortunately lose, but we'll be able to keep up with the quarterly. And um, we have the specialists in place for the game economic design and architecture. Uh, so two there, and then we have another 13 people across the team. This includes um, pretty much every other department. It's community, it's marketing, it's communications, it's uh, growth and business development, it's our business intelligence unit, and then corporate. So uh, legal, finance, uh, ops, and HR. Uh, we still have relationships with uh, with some of the primary studios, Verisoft and Verpaint in particular are names that I think the community is pretty familiar with. So wanted to share those names. Um, but the the real benefit to these uh, these external vendors that we work with is that we have this ability to scale up and scale down. Um, and so we maintain uh, great relationships with them. I do want to make sure it's clear that uh, we've satisfied and will continue to satisfy any financial obligations or liabilities that we have to them. So we're maintaining a great working relationship and. You know, when the time presents itself and the opportunity presents itself, we can scale back up with them in the future. All right. And now the future vision of Star Atlas. Our vision has not changed. You'll recall January 2021, we outlined a white paper of all of the things that we wanted to accomplish. Nothing has changed with that vision. Nothing has changed with our ambitions. Um, it's, it's how do we get from the point where we're at now to that ultimate, ultimate end point. Um, 
we, we happen to have enormous success, unexpected success through 2021. We will see that level of success again, and even at greater levels, in my opinion. But um, we are working through the process that allows us to ship those features and ship those products that uh, that attract people. Like at the end of the day, if we as a business um, and a company don't create a product that is attractive for people to play, then it would have been a failure regardless. Now, that's not what we build for. That's not where our passion lies. That's not how we think this is going to go. Um, and if historical success is any indication of future potential, then I think the writing is on the wall. It's pretty obvious that we will be able to succeed with the products that we're rolling out as we roll those out. And so it's about leveraging the capital and the revenue that we're able to generate off of every feature and every product that we release and reinvest that. It's always been a game of how do we reinvest capital that we've earned into building the long-term vision. Cannot state emphatically enough, we're still building uh, the Unreal Engine product to this day. That hasn't stopped, by the way. We still have a team there. Um, we're still building for that. And everything that we do in between is about getting us from where we are now to that ultimate end vision. All right, just a quick commercial break and we'll be right back. You've seen the show. It was quite a treat. But now you'd like something to eat, so right this way to the concession stand serving Castleberries, the best in the land. Yes, sir. Castleberries is real southern barbecue. All right, now we're going to get into some fun stuff. Let's talk about Sage Labs. We are looking to roll out uh, what we're calling Sage Labs within the next three weeks. Sage Labs is an internal tool that our team built for all of us, for us to do all of the play testing before we roll out the actual uh, Sage product environment. It is all of the programs and all of the gameplay mechanics that are being executed within Sage. So that's your fleet management, it's your inventory management, it's movement, it's extraction, it's crafting systems, it's reward tables. Um, it's everything except for combat, which was never part of the resource extraction and crafting loop that was coming out. It's all of those mechanics um, delivered on mainnet with the real economic simulation, the real economic uh, environment uh, that everybody is you know, um, uh, wildly anticipating. And so uh, the difference with Sage Labs and Sage uh, Rec, or what we're calling Starbase now, is the user interface. And so this is going to be a more simplified user interface. It is a 2D environment. It's probably more akin to that O game concept that we've talked about, you know, all the way back in 2021. Uh, but again, all of the real mechanics on mainnet with real economic outcomes uh, delivered to you guys. And we're looking to do that within three weeks. And if Sage Labs wasn't cool enough, let's talk about the loot. You guys saw me make a post on on uh, Twitter about Star Atlas is going to be running one of the biggest promos of all time. Uh, when I said that, I was referring specifically to the Sage Labs release. What we're looking at doing is uh, rolling out a $1.5 million promo event uh, that will include asset distribution for participation in Sage uh, Sage Labs. So again, the cool thing here is it's all the ships that you own that allow you to participate. Anybody who wants to come into this promotion will need to buy and own ships to be able to uh, uh, participate in that environment. But it's essentially $150,000 worth of assets, worth of loot, worth of Atlas being distributed on a weekly basis through um, a combination of loot redemption based on crafting tables and components that you, uh, that you craft yourself and then combine all of those together and redeem for an item. Uh, or it's uh, entering into a form of a raffle system. And I'm probably sharing too much here, which I, I tend to do, but we're calling these golden tickets. And golden tickets will be a craftable item in Sage Labs. And uh, on a weekly basis, you can enter into these drawings. We've got all of these promotions kind of uh, put together of how we're going to roll that out, how we're going to do the drawings live, um, how it's all provably fair. But effectively, your golden tickets give you access to the weekly drawing. And uh, we'll have great loot in there, $150,000 worth of loot on a weekly basis. All right. Michael Wagner also talked a lot about the mobile app. He's very excited about the mobile app. Let's hear about this. The crew mobile app is this fitness trainer, as you guys know. It's, it is a, um, you can call it move to earn. In our case, it's not Atlas earnings. Um, it, it's actually move to progress. So you're leveling up crew members as you participate in physical activities like walking, running, or cycling. Um, the uh, specific narrative around this is that it is uh, uh, participating in the racing career path, or the racing career mode. Uh, well, as you know, our focus for the Unreal product, especially in 2.2, is competitive combat ground racing or hover racing. And so, Train your character, get them physically fit so that they can perform better when they enter into those races. This is how we were tying it all together. You have a racing career crew member. If you level them up, uh, then you can uh, have a slight competitive edge when you're racing in ground racing, which is why I think it, it's actually something that I, I really do want people to consider if we build this out in lieu of focusing our attention on uh, the rec uh, UI deliverable because these elevated crew members directly lead to performance in the showroom product. But um, 
So how do we monetize it is there, there's a couple of different entry points for users. One of them is the free to play, which I think allows for massive organic growth. Um, if we look at Stepin, for example, with over a million daily active users, well, uh, the reality is across Star Atlas right now, we have about 6,000 daily active users. So we went from 6,000 daily actives to a million, whether they're participating collectively throughout every product we have to offer or not, there will be some pass-through effect and impact on all assets because a million people that are playing with the crew member might go in and buy a ship or might buy some land or might buy a claim stake, right? So it's very supportive of the market structure. Um, uh, but the key point is they can actually get access to that free to play as a as a starting point, which means there's no financial requirement to get involved. Now that free to play crew member that they're using also cannot participate in the um, in the uh, ecosystem, right? Like they can't use a free to play crew member on their ship in showroom or in Sage. But if they decide that they've made sufficient progress and they want to mint that item, then they can mint it. And we're still determining the price structure around uh, crew members themselves. Um, all of you out there that own ships today, you already have some crew members. They're they're embedded in your ship for now, but there will be a snapshot at some point where we actually distribute those out to you. Um, but uh, free to play lets them go in and start leveling it up. They can mint if they decide to. That's revenue for us. Um, and where outside of them utilizing the crew members themselves, I think a health healthy market could form around people who only care about leveling crew members. Uh, with the intention of selling that to other people who don't want to, to go through this process of leveling. It's a convenience fee. Uh, and this is where I've talked a lot about the idea of developing a sustainable economy requires requires balance in the producers and the consumers. Now, there are gamers out there who will be happy to pay, you know, a 10 or $20 premium to get a crew member who's already leveled up uh, because it, it's a fat, it's a shortcut to a leveled character, right? Um, and if they're willing to pay $20 and somebody else is willing to go and do the work of physical exercise, well, we match those two people together through the marketplace. And now the mint cost might be $10 and the crew member's worth 20 so they immediately mint their crew member because they know they can sell it for 20 and make uh, make a profit for themselves. Uh, so anyway, that was a, that was a pretty extensive um, answer, but it, it is large. The revenue is largely based on crew minting, uh, but there's also charms and mods and um, uh, character enhancements that you can earn while you're out walking around. So what we are debating internally right now is whether or not we spend some time after the Sage Labs release to focus either on the mobile companion app or on the UI integration. So you know what we've called Rec now star based. Um, I will share some thoughts with you guys, but uh, Santi and Dom are going to help. They're going to post the poll on this so we can get some feedback. Everyone in the community cares about growth. I just want you guys to be aware that the mobile app is, to me, uh, an enormous opportunity to grow the user base through this um, you know, mobile entry point into the Starless ecosystem. In fact, those users are all integrated into the economy because they're leveling up crew members. Uh, they're able to trade and sell those crew members after the mint. Uh, from a company perspective, it actually gives us an opportunity to generate revenue off of a new asset class, which is obviously beneficial for things like Runway. Um, so I'm not fully committed on going the mobile route. Uh, if, if what you guys want is the uh, is the UI layer with, with Rec, we can do that. But the alternative would be, and this is how we'll pose the um, uh, pose the, the survey, but uh, we could move from Sage Labs to mobile, and then on the rec release, we would include combat. So it would actually be all of the existing games uh, or ex existing mechanics, but include combat in with the UI layer. So that's the choice you have to make. Do you want Sage uh, rec as the next release without combat, or do you want mobile first and then Sage including combat? All right, guys, now it's Danny, another co-founder of Star Atlas's turn to talk. He's going to tell us all about the Unreal Engine 5 side of the future of Star Atlas. This is sped up kind of quick. I'm sorry. It's just to keep the time nice to shorter. With, with everyone so um, people can understand the vision and, and the purpose for keeping the, the UE5 going. So the idea for 2.2 is, and I've been personally calling it preseason 2.2, um, not necessarily showroom R2.2, because um, the idea with preseason is we launch a public, publicly available game, open access, free to play, technically. They can come in and play it. Nobody has to go through the whole closed access, getting a key to play it anymore. But because that's going to be what it looks like in the Epic Game Store, there are some blockers that I want to put in place to make sure it's a game and not just a cooler tech demo. Um, and, and what that means is by adding progression. So you take a tech demo, you make it very cool and fun by itself, but that's not what keeps people coming back and staying in there. And so the progression is the important part. And so that's the blocker for this coming out. I've got a number of items in uh, what I'd like to deliver in progression. All of them are mocked up, all of them are designed. There's already some of them being implemented. Um, but we have an MVP version of progression. And this is on-chain progression and on-chain token rewards through progression. And and my favorite one that I think covers everything gives us the, the fundamental uh, platform and technology so we can do all the different progressional, uh, progression lanes, which is called Ship Mastery. It's a, it's a system where uh, if you own the ship and you have a Ship Mastery card, you go through like 10 or so levels, and each of the levels you, you'll get different rewards like weapons, shield generators, engines, 
epic and rare skins, uh, maybe even charms and posters related to that specific ship. And then by the time you reach level 10, you get a cool legendary skin, which has like some mess changes and some, and, and possibly even some character skins. But the idea is you go through and you master that ship uh, by racing on the ground track, racing on the air track, racing in space track, dogfighting. Uh, say if you kill people on the track during a, a race, then you get like 10 XP. Uh, so you get like fighter XP, uh, but you also get fighter XP specifically for that ship that you're, you're trying to master. Uh, and then as you get XP towards that ship, hit the levels, then it's a really nice uh, uh, compartmentalized progression campaign. Uh, around each ship, and we can release those as, as new content over time. And so this is kind of the, the big feature that goes from a tech demo and turns it into a game. It, I, I think it also makes us attractive to people just coming off the street, know nothing about Star Atlas, see our listing in, in Epic Games. We give them a way to jump into the, the game for free uh, and have a, a way to progress and get all the way to, like, hopefully also level up in, in Racer and Fighter um, and, and level, at least level up in one of the ship mastery cards and have something to show for it. These are actual on-chain tokens and and progression, and so you can you know also <laughs> go and sell them on the on the marketplace too. So that's part of the whole game. Also, we need the robust multiplayer, which MetaGravity has already been priced into our runway, and so so their effort is ongoing. They're starting a full code dev with us now, um, starting next week, and uh, which is where we start replacing all the current P2P multiplayer stuff that we have. So that's going to be enhanced and robust. We'll be all we'll also have like a a way to release additional maps and additional game modes. Mm -hmm. So. The point of having combat and racing as the first major playable mechanics is because it allows us to make so many more game modes so much quick, so much faster than uh, you know this first one, and we can just like test out a bunch of fun, cool things. I, we did the same thing in Splitgate. We released a ton of different modes. Once you have like shooting and portaling, um, now it just opens up like yeah, you can go crazy. And so MetaGravity is providing us with the ability to do that easily. Um, like even an arena shooter where you don't just use handheld guns, you're using a ship and there's some like battlefield aspects to it. But anyway, so that component, metagravity multiplayer, the ship mastery, uh, progression as an MVP, hope for a lot more. There's a lot more design, it's pretty cool. Um, and then the, the shipping crew configurator. So that means like skins and components. So, you know, when you go through the ship mastery and get something like a weapon, you can go and, and configure your ship, place that weapon on, you know, maybe even progress faster because you have a better gun and see that immediately. So that's important as well for the release. Uh, also, all the mock-ups are done, all the designs are done. A lot of the gameplay ability systems that are needed is all in place already. Um, and then the last the last piece needed is the race event scheduler. So that works with our, our large, potentially 5,000, 30,000 <laughs> uh, instance where you can uh, go to the race scheduler and it's basically like a Google calendar and you either sign up for the next available race, which is like if there's a countdown, you're starting right now, or just wait 10 minutes for the next race uh, or you set a race in the future. And then we can even like put sponsored races like anytime in the future. And, and, and people can sit there in the main instance where uh, we have the 5,000 plus people and observe these races and that's all on chain too. So we should, you know, there could be some side things that happen with ongoing races, just saying. And then and then also having the, the private instance or the public instance list of like smaller races on, on maps. We don't want to make everyone wait to have to progress based on like what's in the queue for the public races. And yeah, that's kind of the overall vision for Unreal. And relating that back to the, the downsizing of the team, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we still have quite a number of people in contracting and, and vendor positions. And there's individual arrangements with each one of them that um, we're going to find out probably this week how that extends out. But even if that were to, if that were to be the case, if we were able to keep a, a large um, section of that, then we're still looking at pretty good chances for the end of this year release. If we're, we lose more than we think, then possibly Q1 2024. And 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 there's also a strategic decision on when you go public. You know, do we want to compete with all the other Christmas games that are coming out at the same time? Um, so that's going to factor in, of course, um, which gives us more time to promote and, and really time that because it's a public release. It's important. Um, I know we all know so much about the product, but um, uh, you have that one moment to to really shine when you go public. Um, and before that, you know, community first, of course, there will be beta periods, and you guys will still be able to check things out uh, in a closed access way. So, yeah, that kind of covers it, I think. And lastly, we have Michael Wagner talking about the Buddy Link referral system. It's the last one, guys. We've had a good relationship with, and and more recently have been able to work with the team at Laddercaster. Um, on the next version of our StarPath referral system. Um, really amazing guys. Uh, Laddercaster, you guys probably played their game, but they were uh, pioneers in on-chain gaming on Solana. And uh, But they have a program that they call BuddyLink. And again, this is a referral system fully on-chain. And so we are looking now at the integration of BuddyLink into... Um, well, into Star Atlas that, uh, again, is a referral system. We have a much more aggressive proposed uh, reward structure for that that would include 30% uh, revenue share on uh, primary market asset sales, as well as 30% on uh, the secondary marketplace fees. Now, I I'm sure you all understand we can't go out of pocket on secondary transactions. 
Um, however, there is a 4% transaction fee that we collect as a company. Um, and so even if somebody you refer buys on the secondary market against uh, from another player, uh, you would get 30% of that 4%. That's the way we're thinking about it now. But um, as, as the inventory below origination price gets absorbed um, and primary market sales take place, you would also get 30% of that total amount of a primary market purchase, which is pretty significant. Uh, you know, simple example, uh, somebody buys a, a $10,000 ship, you get $3,000 for referring that person. But in addition to that, I wanted to, why I wanted to bring it up is that we're go also going to add a component of the golden ticket uh, rewards to this as well. So golden tickets, that's the raffle system. You can craft these golden tickets, but if you're referring people and they're making purchases, then you'd also, not only would you get the revenue share component, but you'd also get a golden ticket. So then you can go in and uh, participate in the raffle and maybe score yourself a $100,000 tank ship. All right, guys, for me personally, I am very excited about the future of Star Atlas. It seems like we have quite the runway ahead of us. I hope you guys held strong, held on to your ships, did not sell your Atlas and did not sell your Polis. We are going to make it. We're going to get the whole team back together. I know it. For those of you that sold, all I have to say is <laughs> I love you guys all. I'll check you later. I'll see you in the next video. Please like and subscribe if you enjoy my content. Later.